Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to this session of the course Therapeutic Nutrition. This is the fifth module that is Nutritional Management of Non-Communicable Diseases. This is the ninth and last lecture of this module in which we shall be studying about Nutritional Management of Cardiovascular Diseases. I am Dr. Jaspreet Kaur, presently working as Assistant Professor in Government College for Girls, Ludhiana, Punjab, affiliated to Punjab University, Chandigarh. And this project is funded by DTH Swayam Prabha, MHRD, New Delhi. In the previous lecture, we had studied about coronary heart disease. We studied the concept of coronary heart diseases and we studied what is atherosclerosis. Then we studied how coronary heart disease progresses. And then we studied about lipoproteins. And then we saw how we can diagnose cardiovascular diseases. In this lecture, we shall be studying about complications associated with the cardiovascular diseases and nutritional management of coronary heart disease. Arterial changes, they begin in the infancy and progress asymptomatically throughout adulthood. The clinical outcome of impaired arterial function arising from atherosclerosis that will depend upon the location of the impairment. In coronary arteries, atherosclerosis can cause angina, that is a myocardial infarction, it can cause sudden death and in cerebral arteries, it can cause stroke and transient ischemic attacks. In peripheral circulation, it can cause limb ischemia that is because of inadequate blood supply to the limb and it can lead to gangrene. Therefore, atherosclerosis is underlying cause of many forms of cardiovascular diseases. So now let us discuss what are the possible complications which are associated with cardiovascular diseases. An important complication of uh, cardiovascular disease is myocardial infarction. It is also known as heart attack. It can also cause systolic and diastolic dysfunction where the, uh, the way heart is pumping out blood and the way it is receiving blood that is affected. Pericarditis can happen that refers to inflammation of the pericardium. This pericardium is uh, two thin layers of a sac like tissue that surrounds the heart and it holds it in place and it will help in its uh, proper working of the heart. A stroke can occur when the blood supply to a part of our brain it is interrupted or it is reduced and it will prevent the brain tissues from getting oxygen and nutrients and the brain cells they begin to die in minutes. Along with that aneurysm that is uh, when the blood gets filled in the blood vessels they get dilated and the shape of the vessel that that is changed this is known as aneurysm. This can lead to gangrene that is death of body tissues due to lack of blood flow. The usual cause of angina is narrowing of major coronary artery that is because of atherosclerosis. It could also be because of systemic hypertension. It will increase the myocardial demand and if the supply of the blood to the heart muscle is less, the angina will happen. So the uh, routine symptoms of angina are the pain is usually over the center of the chest but it can be felt from the jaw and uh, to the arm also. 
the duration of the angina is very short and it can be relieved when the person is taking rest or he is not exercising myocardial infarction it is an initial phase of cardiovascular disease which is caused by blockage of coronary artery which is supplying blood to the heart and it generally occurs when the fibrous plaques they coils together they join together and a blood clots so this will result in complete blockage in the artery which is supplying oxygen and nutrients to the blood to the heart muscles congestive heart failure it is an end stage chronic decompensated disease that is a product of injury to heart muscle due to atherosclerosis or it could be because of hypertension or rheumatic fever resulting in progressive weakness of the heart muscles it causes left ventricular systolic dysfunction also over a period of time it causes pulmonary edema causing breathing problems the person will uh, having lot many issues and he will not be able to sleep because of breathing issues this will result in blood accumulation in the right side of the heart and this will affect the normal circulation the two hormones that control the water balance they also fail in this condition and aldosterone which conserves sodium and water that will actually worsen the edema that is why this condition is known as decompensated disease the common symptoms associated with this problem are there will be swelling in the abdomen there will be swelling of feet and ankles they are because of edema and water retention the person will be uh, finding difficult to sleep because uh, he will not be able to breathe in the sleeping position there will be irregular or rapid pulse rate he could be coughing there will be pronounced neck veins because of water accumulation there will be a sensation of feeling of the heart beat and decrease alertness or concentration could be felt in many cases there will be decreased urine production also let us discuss nutritional management goals for cardiovascular diseases the first goal is reduction of weight if the person is overweight or obese second objective is reduction of intake of total fat saturated fat and cholesterol third objective is lifestyle changes that means increase in physical exercise moderation in alcohol intake and absolutely no smoking and consuming balanced adequate diet which is rich in calcium chromium iron and zinc that is to be promoted and along with that medical management is through various lipid lowering drugs the management of total dietary fat involves that the energy provided from fat should remain less than 30% of the total calories of which saturated and polyunsaturated fatty acids they should provide less than 10% of total calories while monounsaturated fatty acids they should provide remaining 10% of total calories the visible fat intake should not be more than 4 to 5 teaspoon per day that is recommended and the fat composition of these 4 to 5 teaspoon is equally important see the oils and the fats they are coming from different food sources when we talk about uh, mono unsaturated fatty acids the oils which are rich in mufa they have multiple benefits they will decrease the low density lipoprotein levels in the blood and they will also lower the cholesterol level and when we talk about polyunsaturated fatty acid rich oils they will decrease ldl levels only so when we are discussing how much of the contribution of fat should come from each oil it is important to consider that mufa saturated fatty acid and pufa they should be ideal ratio is 1 is to 1 is to 
and in this case in case of cardiovascular diseases it has to be decreased in the case of saturated fatty acids so when it comes to polyunsaturated fatty acids these polyunsaturated fatty acids again they have two type of uh, fatty acids that is omega 3 fatty acid and omega 6 fatty acid so even if we are giving only pufa we have to see that what is the composition of that pufa oil how much is the un n3 level how much is the n6 level and we have to uh, see it is good if we can provide an oil which contains uh, omega 3 fatty acid which can provide 1 to 2% of the total energy of a person uh, and then omega 6 if it can provide 5 to 8% of the energy and a very good balanced oil which has a ratio of n6 to n3 ratio as 5 to 10 parts of n6 and one part of n3 that is really beneficial for any person any healthy person or any cardiovascular disease patient and along with the uh, saturated fatty acid along with the mono unsaturated fatty acid with polyfatty uh, unsaturated fatty acid trans fats they are also an important determinants and it has to be uh, ensured that their percentage in our diet is less than 1% of our total calories so that permits around 1 to 2 gram of trans fat per day cholesterol we know increased cholesterol in the blood it is known as hypercholesterolemia which leads to atherosclerosis it is a natural component of food and it is present only in animal kingdom and plants uh, uh, they do not contain cholesterol so what are the foods which are rich in cholesterol foods such as mutton pork ham sausages lamb chicken then uh, grand glandular meat such as brain liver kidneys they contain uh, cholesterol along with that egg yolk whole milk cheese ice cream butter desi ghee all of the uh, these uh, food items they contain cholesterol so what are saturated fatty acids saturated fatty acids they raise the level of ldl and total cholesterol in our blood because they will lower the ldl receptor activities they are the single most important factor which cause increase in c reactive protein which is an important inflammatory marker it is there in palmitic and then meristic acid they in, they increase the ldl cholesterol level and uh, this is followed by another type of saturated fatty acid that is lauric acid so all three of them they will increase the ldl level in our blood they are uh, mostly found in animal fats as white marble like solid at room temperature and 1 gram of saturated fatty acid can actually increase the serum cholesterol by 2.7 mg therefore the energy which is provided from the saturated fatty acids should be less than 10% of the total calories so what are the foods which are rich in saturated fatty acids milk fat butter pure ghee coconut oil palm oil margarine vanaspati and red meats uh, they are rich sources of saturated fatty acids now let us talk about mono unsaturated fatty acids that is mufa they are liquid at room temperature they should provide 10% of the total energy they are excellent uh, fats as they will reduce the ldl levels and they do not increase the triglycerides and along with that another benefit is that they will not affect the hdl level so therefore they are actually helpful in prevention of atherosclerosis oleic acid it is a mono unsaturated fatty acid which is of great clinical relevance so what are uh, the food items which are rich sources of mufa peanut oil rice bran canola oil olive oil almond oil gingerly and uh, mustard oil they are rich sources of mufa 
let's talk about PUFA that is polyunsaturated fatty acids. Just like MUFA, they are also liquid at room temperature. They are of two main types which are of dietary significance. The first one is linoleic acid. The second one is alpha linoleic acid. So the linoleic acid is also known as N6. So uh, and alpha linoleic acid is also known as N3. The ideal ratio of N3 and N6 should be 5 to 10 parts should be N6 and one part of the oil that should be comprised of N3 uh, fatty acids. So, so let's understand what are the rich sources of N6 that is linoleic acid and what are the rich sources of N3 that is alpha linoleic acid. So when we talk about N6 fatty acids, they are found in larger amount in safflower oil, sunflower oil, sesame oil and corn oil. And when we talk about N3 that is alpha linoleic acid, it is rich in canola oil, olive oil, rapeseed oil, mustard oil, soybean oil and fish oil. Along with that, we can consume certain food items such as wheat, bajra, green leafy vegetables, methi, mustard that is rye, then almonds, black gram, cowpea that is lobia, rajma, kidney bean and soy. Along with that, uh, certain nuts and oil seeds such as walnuts, flax seeds, they are rich sources of omega-3 or N3 fatty acids. And there are two essential fatty acids that is uh, eicosapentaenoic acid, EPA, and another one is decosohexanoic acid, DHA. So uh, if we take two servings of fish in a week or we take two gram fish oil, it is actually helpful in reducing the triglycerides and it will help in increasing HDL level of the person. Now let's talk about trans fatty acids. These trans fatty acids, they contain pro-inflammatory effects. So what are these? They will raise the LDL cholesterol such as uh, meristic acid. Then it will lower the good cholesterol that is HDL level. They will increase the lipoprotein A level. The sources of these trans fatty acids are uh, uh, gut of some ruminants such as meat and dairy. And then uh, it is there in hydrogenated fats. And these uh, hydrogenated fat actually changes the natural form of fat to another form of fat that is known as trans form. That is why our bodies, they cannot use them in a proper way. And that actually causes harm to the body. So it is found in bakery items, in the fried foods, and it develops when we use the oil again and again for frying purposes. As we have seen, all the oils, they have their own composition. Some are rich in PUFA, some are rich in MUFA, and their composition within that fatty acids that is also varied. So here a new concept of blended oils has come up. And its additional advantage is, is that it uses more than one source of oil and it will help in balancing different types of fatty acids. So such type of blended oils, they can be considered. So let's summarize the effect of different type of fatty acids on atherosclerosis. Let's talk about blood cholesterol first. So the saturated fatty acids, they will increase the blood cholesterol, whereas oleic acid N6 and N3 they will lower the level of blood cholesterol. When we talk about HDL cholesterol saturated fatty acids they will decrease the level of good cholesterol whereas uh, N6 it will also decrease the HDL level of cholesterol but N3 and oleic acid this will not have any effect. And when we talk about triglycerides, saturated fatty acids, they will actually increase our triglyceride level. Olic and N6, they do not have any effect, but N3, it will help that it will decrease the triglyceride level. And when it comes to another uh, factor that is platelet aggregation, which is a very important factor in development of atherosclerosis. 
तो सैचुरेटेड फैटी एसिड्स दे विल डिक्रीज द प्लेटलेट एग्रीगेशन फैक्टर एंड देर इज नो चेंज विच हैपन्स इन द ओलिक एसिड एंड एन सिक्स एंड एन थ्री ऑल्सो दे डू नॉट हैव एनी इम्पैक्ट ऑन द प्लेटलेट एग्रीगेशन what type of carbohydrates and fiber a person should take as we know the simple carbohydrates that is monosaccharides are absorbed to the fastest and the polysaccharides which are the complex carbohydrates they get absorbed to the slowest so it is important that a person includes the complex carbohydrates in the diet and fiber it is beneficial for all the cardiovascular diseases and it is found uh, in two type of sources that is water insoluble and soluble types of fiber soluble fibers they are such as coming from pectins gums and mucilages they will help in lowering the cholesterol levels and you can also found them in lentils legumes oats fruits and vegetables and when we talk about insoluble fiber it is also known as roughage so it is the chewy outer uh, skin and fiber of the seeds it comes from fruits vegetables and grains it is required for good digestive health and it will prevent constipation also so an intake of around, around 25 to 40 gram of soluble fiber it has been proven beneficial uh, by many studies so if a person can include five or more servings of fruits and vegetables and he is taking six or more servings of whole grains they can meet the needs of complex carbohydrates and fiber in the diet of a cardiovascular patient let's talk about proteins as the quality of protein it has immense effect on the serum lipoproteins as we know uh, there are two types of protein sources one is the protein which is coming from the vegetarian sources and another one is which is coming from the non vegetarian sources so the plant protein uh, it should be preferred over animal origin uh, proteins because the protein coming from the animal origin it will be uh, rich in uh, cholesterol uh, and it will contain certain amount of uh, saturated fatty acids also when we uh, consider the plant origin protein they are rich in dietary fiber also and then the uh, second benefit is they do not contain a uh, cholesterol when it comes to balance of sodium and potassium it is a useful indicator to know and to control the cardiovascular risk as whenever the sodium level of the diet and the blood level of a person is higher it increases the risk of blood pressure and heart disease heart attacks and stroke and it is good if the person can take high potassium level because it will help in counteracting the action of sodium so a person who has high sodium level and low potassium level of their diet the risk of heart disease and death will increase many fold so it is recommended that if a person can stick to 2300 mg of sodium and high potassium level it will lower his cardiovascular risk and it will be beneficial for controlling the progression of cardiovascular diseases and if the person can maintain his sodium level to say around 1500 mg per day that means equivalent to half teaspoon of salt it will lower the risk further let's talk about antioxidants as we know that antioxidants they have cardio protective effect and when a person is taking good amount of all the vitamins as per the rda the needs of many antioxidants such as vitamin a uh, vitamin c they are met so let us talk about the principle of diet therapy in coronary heart disease so first thing is that the person is recommended to go for 
low calorie diet the second modification is the fat modification that is the diet should have low saturated fatty acid low trans fat acids and low cholesterol diet should be recommended and the diet should be rich in polyunsaturated fatty acids and in polyunsaturated fatty acids it is good if the ratio of omega 6 to omega 3 fatty acids can be maintained to 5 to 10 parts of omega 6 fatty acids and one part of omega 3 fatty acid and along with low carbohydrate normal protein minerals and vitamins they are suggested in the diet and it is advisable that a person takes high fiber diet and increases the antioxidants in the diet with the help of different foods now let us talk about the treatment and dietary management of angina pectoris as we know that in this condition the patient feels pain in on slightest amount of movement or exertion so uh, the dietary treatment would be to maintain ideal weight for age to lower the blood pressure through drug and diet control to avoid exertion and unnecessary stress uh, on the heart and to follow a prudent diet that is dash diet which we recommended for the hypertensives in case of myocardial infarction the objectives of dietary management would be to provide rest to the injured heart to maintain an optimum nutritional status to achieve and maintain desirable body weight and to prevent the development of another attack of myocardial infarction so in that case energy intake may be initially begin at very low calorie diet that is 800 kilo calorie which will be slowly progress to 1200 kilo calorie diet the patient's energy intake it can be calculated by watching that he is able to maintain his weight which is preferably 1 to 2 kilograms below his ideal body weight to reduce the uh, pressure on the heart and the protein intake generally remains same and the calorie uh, content of the fat should not be more than 20% of the total calories and dietary cholesterol intake should remain below 200 mg per day carbohydrates they should provide 60% of the calories and the sodium content of content of the diet should be kept at 2 g let's talk about dietary management of congestive heart failure as we know this is a decompensated advanced heart disease so here the energy requirements they are generally based on the residual cardiac function and the usual body weight of the patient is taken into account normally the patients they can tolerate anywhere between 10 to 25 kilo calorie per kg ideal body weight and protein is 0.8 to 1 gram of uh, uh, per kg ideal body weight the patient is recommended low fiber simple carbohydrate diet as the person is having multiple issues which uh, he is not comfortable so these simple type of uh, foods which are low in fiber they are actually beneficial in relieving many of the symptoms of congestive heart failure so a person can choose semolina refined flour rice then dehust pulses can be given along with that papaya mango and uh, some vegetables like brinjal pumpkin gourd they can be given and whole cereal pulses legume lotus stem cabbage and soy flour they should be avoided in this patient and fats they should not be providing more than 20% of the total calorie uh, which a person is taking and this diet should be low in cholesterol and saturated fatty acids and when we come to vitamins and minerals sodium intake should be Uh, 135 to 145 milli equivalent per liter and the potassium intake should be around 3.5 to 5 milli equivalent per liter and uh, this pertains to mild to moderate sodium restriction and it is beneficial for such patients 
so the high sodium fruits and vegetables such as fenugreek seeds lettuce then spinach beetroot tomato grapes lychee uh, musk melon and many processed food items and preserves they should be avoided by such patients so the requirements of all the vitamins they will remain same as per the recommended dietary allowance coming to the fluids that is an important part when it comes to the management of uh, this patient the patient who is on diuretics they may consume normal amount of fluids that is around 1.5 liters daily but the people who are not on diuretics the fluid allowance is calculated as what is the urine output of last 24 hours we add 500 ml to make up for the losses through various channels of the body then weighing of the patient every day is needed to find out the gain in weight due to fiber uh, fluid retention uh, and uh, so restriction is based on that behavior counseling interventions they are proven to be beneficial to reduce the weight of the person to manage uh, blood pressure or and hypertension to curtail the dyslipidemia and then to correct the blood sugar level his body mass index and increasing his physical activity so overall for lifestyle management behavior counseling interventions they are very important weight control is an important aspect when it comes to management of cardiovascular diseases terms so because overweight brings lot of risk of hypertension type 2 diabetes and uh, dyslipidemia and on top of that if the person has high visceral fat he is at a higher risk of developing cardiovascular diseases now uh, international diabetes federation that is idf it suggests that the waist circumference of an asian uh, man it should not be more than 90 cm and in case of women it should not be more than 80 cm because more visceral fat it will cause insulin resistance it will cause further problems leading to cardiovascular diseases and it is advisable that a person who is exercising and uh, if he is managing a good amount of activity level it will actually help in increasing hdl level and uh, it will decrease ldl level along with weight loss exercise and physical activity they are very important and not only they help in uh, controlling the weight they will also be beneficial to take care of other associated physiological problems such as diabetes and then cardiovascular problems so it is advisable that a person adopts a healthier lifestyle which includes 150 hours of moderate intensity aerobic exercises in one week or 75 minutes of vigorous activity in a week and it has to be ensured that at least 10 minutes of a session is maintained on most days of the week exercise for muscle strength should be adopted at least two days in a week because good muscle strength will ensure that the protein level of the uh, body is good and that will improve the body composition and uh, weight for the weight loss it is good if a person is physically active daily for an hour and for older people because they cannot uh, go for this kind of physical activity so for such cardiovascular uh, patients uh, it is tailor-made exercise and physical activity plan alcohol as we know in moderation it is not having any harmful effect on the person but if the person is addicted and he takes uh, alcohol more than moderation it will have physiological and uh, uh, psychosocial effects so it is advised that person should not uh, start a drink if he is not drinking just for the sake of cardiovascular health so those who drink they should be taking the alcohol in moderation 
Now, what is moderation? That means they can take 30 to 60 ml of a drink daily. One drink is equivalent to 150 ml of wine or 360 ml of beer or 45 ml of 80 proof liquor. Let's talk about caffeine also. Moderate coffee consumption, that is fine. If a person is taking around two cups, that is 200 ml in one day, which contains not more than 400 milligrams of caffeine in a day, that is okay. The person who do not drink, they should not uh, begin to eat caffeine. And coffee, it has uh, been found to be associated with the reduced risk of type 2 diabetes mellitus and cardiovascular diseases. It has also been found to be beneficial in Parkinson disease also. So uh, if a person is taking uh, coffee in moderation, it does not have any harmful effect. Let's talk about tobacco. Tobacco is most important risk factor for cardiovascular diseases as it increases the risk of complication of hypertension. Chewing tobacco, it actually doubles the risk of developing a heart attack. And along with smokers or uh, uh, tobacco chewers, non-smoker or passive smokers also, they are at higher risk, say around 25 to 30% increased risk of cardiovascular diseases. So tobacco is an important risk factor which should be taken care of. Let's summarize what we have studied in this lecture. We studied that the atherosclerosis, it is underlying cause of many forms of cardiovascular diseases. We studied the role of various types of fats in causing cardiovascular diseases and management of cardiovascular diseases. Then we studied about the dietary management during various stages of the atherosclerosis. That is, we studied about the management of angina pectoris, of myocardial infarction and congestive heart failure. And we also studied what is the role of lifestyle modification in coronary heart disease. That is, what is the role of physical activity and certain habits uh, such as alcohol, then uh, caffeine consumption. So this brings us to the end of this topic that is nutritional management of cardiovascular diseases and this finishes our fifth module that is management of various lifestyle diseases. Thank you.